Welcome to our GATE training webinar. Thank you for joining us. This webinar will be discussing motor learning and motor learning research. So a very important consideration when we think about learning is to differentiate between acquiring the skill initially, then retaining that skill over time, and finally being able to generalize that skill to different situations, adapting it to new tasks. Learning is all of these. We can think of it as the stages of learning. So where we would have acquiring the skill initially, you may not always be accurate, movement might be slower, but then with fluency, you're becoming more proficient and achieving the skill without direction and instruction. Finally, generalizing and adapting is continuously learning to apply the skill in novel situations. As we consider the skills themselves, we have discrete skills, clear beginning and end, such as sitting to standing, more complex skills, and then finally continuous skills, which would be walking. Walking is considered a continuous skill. Now there's also the environmental context. So in a closed situation, it's very predictable and stable. But with an open situation, you cannot actually effectively plan your entire movement in advance because you may be adapting to a changing environment, such as walking through a crowded cafeteria. This is a continuum with a semi-predictable environment somewhere in between. Think about the feedback or the amount of support or prompting that occurs when teaching a new skill. We will want to systematically fade down the amount of support from full physical support to perhaps modeling or demonstration, and finally verbal input until the child is able to perform their skill completely independently. This would be a most to least prompting. Similarly, we have least to most, and this may be in the later stages of learning where we allow the child to attempt their best effort and only provide verbal input or tactile and physical support when absolutely needed. So how do our interventions impact learning? We need to look at both practice and feedback. When we think about practice, we're thinking about what is practiced, when it is practiced, and how it is practiced. And we will look at specific motor learning terms related to each of these areas. The first is specificity. The motor learning is going to relate very distinctly to what specifically is practiced. And this is borne out by research where the limb involved in the motor task, in the motor skill that is practiced, there's actually a correlation to changes in neuroplasticity in the brain of the corresponding area. This research review by Moreau also emphasizes that point where it is gait training that affects gait training outcomes strengthening does not. Salience discusses the importance and relevance to the person of the task that they are doing. And this is why goal setting is important because we will have that motivation and that attention to task when it matters to the individual. This brings us to thinking about when a skill is practiced. No one disputes that practice has a positive effect on learning. Other variables, can be manipulated to benefit learning, but the sheer amount of practice is important. Those familiar with Malcolm Gladwell's book, The Outliers, are familiar with the idea that it takes 10,000 hours of practice to separate a violin virtuoso from a mere violin player. As we think about these sheer hours of practice, is there anything we can do to speed learning? That is where these motor learning strategies come in. When we look at children, typically developing children learning to walk, it is thousands of steps in a day. However, they aren't all done at once. They are broken up and performed intermittently between periods of not walking. Also, practice is performed in a variety of contexts. This contributes to learning. So practice scheduling matters. And that's the discussion of massed versus distributed practice. Mass practice 
has more time spent in practice than in rest. Distributed practice has more time spent in rest periods than in practice. The motor learning theory here is that rest not only allows for restoration from fatigue and renewal of your motivation, but also something happens in the brain. There's a consolidation of learning that is occurring during that break. This is a landmark systematic review. Most of the research up until that point was on continuous practice, but this established that distributed practice does have good outcomes in terms of retention. Overall, more time will be required for distributed practice. For example, walking for five minutes, resting for 10 minutes, you would need to continue for one and a half hours to get 30 minutes of practice total. But we can also look at this as practicing walking for 10 minutes at three different times in the day, or for 15 minutes twice a day. Now for discrete tasks, the effect of massed versus distributed practice is less clear. The 2013 reference is actually able adults doing a specifically instructed sport-related motor skill, but we're seeing more current research suggesting that for a discrete skill, mass practice can be appropriate. That brings us to how does the practice occur? The first point, variability is very important for retention and learning. Variability can be a matter of the task variation as well as the context or environment. Constant practice is when the parameters are essentially unchanged. You can imagine taking steps on a treadmill, for example. Variable practice means that there are different parameters within that one practice session. The way we do this might be block practice, where we do one skill, drilling it over and over before moving on to another skill within that practice session. And then we have random practice, where you are interspersing a number of different skills randomly within that same practice session. We find that acquisition is better with blocked practice, but skill retention and transfer is better with random practice. So what improves immediate performance is not necessarily what improves retention over the long run. The open diamond is the random practice. The black rectangle is block practice. With early practice, the movement time is shorter, showing better performance with blocked. In intermediate practice, the difference is not as extreme, but then in terms of retention, for the individual who practiced with random variable practice, their long-term retention was improved and they could perform that skill better. So variable practice improves that transfer, that generalization, that adaptation, that long-term outcome even though the variability produces more performance errors during the initial learning. Contextual interference is a word that discusses this random practice. It's that interference resulting from practicing those various skills within the same session. So alternating from one task to another and then back demands that constant restructuring of performance with slightly different solutions each time. This problem solving is valuable for long-term retention and generalization so that high CI is resulting in better learning, and the low CI is actually inhibiting performance for those novel task demands. The Pareto research in 2017 was in fact with individuals with cerebral palsy performing a computer maze, and the random practice led to better performance for transfer tests. For children, the effects of blocked versus random practice is less clear ZIP did a research project with children who were performing a frisbee toss. Interestingly, block practice in that case did show a benefit for retention and transfer. So it suggests that the task difficulty and the child's stage of learning do need to be taken into consideration as we teach motor skills. So for simpler tasks, it seems that we have random practice as our optimal option, whereas for highest difficulty tasks, random practice is less optimal. For beginners, the lower level of CI is more appropriate, and for highly skilled individuals, random practice is more effective. Difficulty is our next topic. If we are requiring the learner to repeat the problem-solving process rather than just repeating a movement, the practice is difficult, effortful, but learning is achieved. 
we need to consider the skill level of the individual, the complexity of the task, the task environment, as well as the assistance provided. And as these researchers point out, we need to look beyond the challenge of the task itself to the ability of the learner and the environmental context. So they differentiate between the functional task difficulty related to the ability level of the person and the environmental context as compared to nominal task difficulty, which is the characteristics of the task itself. So our optimal level of challenge will result in learning. On the one hand, increasing task difficulty increases learning potential. At the same time, we have to realize that is expected to decrease performance. So we want to maximize learning and yet minimize detriment to performance during practice. This tells us that in order to make progress, we have to be comfortable with effort, and we will only be growing and learning when we are uncomfortable. MOVE has a great way of putting this. Just manageable difficulty. Challenging skill development, but not making it too difficult. Which brings us to part whole practice. Learning parts of a motor skill, and then integrating it to practice the whole task versus learning the entire skill as a whole. There are benefits to both types of practice, and the field of motor learning offers considerations for the use of whole and part practice during motor skill acquisition. Naylor and Briggs gave us their hypothesis of task complexity in organization, Schmidt and Risberg looking at skill classification. Let's think about the hypothesis of task complexity in organization. How many components are involved in the task? Walking would be considered a continuous skill, so that is low complexity. High complexity might be transitioning from lying to standing. In terms of the organization, are the components interrelated or interdependent? Walking involves both upper and lower extremity reciprocal swing and multiple joint involvement. It would be considered high organization. Naylor and Briggs' recommendation is that whole practice is appropriate for a skill that is low in complexity and high in organization. Walking is indeed a skill where whole practice is relevant. And this has been borne out by research where we've had stroke patients balancing on their hemiparetic limb. The results after the balance training did show that patients bore weight more symmetrically but did not in fact increase the single limb stance on the paretic limb when walking. Now, there are advantages to part practice in certain circumstances when we need to simplify the skill or promote early success for motivation or focus practice on our problem components. So as we consider part task versus whole task, again, we need to look at the task, the learner, and the environment. And that brings us to the skill classification approach of Schmidt and Risberg, where they consider the task, the environment, and also the person and their attention demands. The attention demands of the motor performance, the attention demands of concurrent cognitive tasks, for example, and whether we can simplify and then increase challenge as learning progresses. So learning parts of a task may be helpful during those early stages, but whole task practice results in overall better movement quality and must be our final goal. As we segment those segments to practice, we want to recombine them into sequencing. For example, the practice from sit to stand and then taking a few steps following on that. Fractionalizing is appropriate when it's a dual task. We practice each part and then recombine, or we may simplify and then increase the challenge. Fontana's meta-analysis has concluded that more research is necessary to find which practice, whole or part, is most ideal. Transfer appropriate training is so important. Moving beyond the part and whole practice to utilizing the skill in the environments and in the context where it will be used. So we can think of it as first practicing those most needed components, then the whole task, and finally taking that task and generalizing it into natural environments. Walking to the office to take 
the attendants walking to a vending machine, combining walking with saying hello to favorite people in the hallway without stopping the gate. This brings us to the feedback segment of our presentation. If we think about feedback, first we attempt the skill, then we receive feedback, and then we're adapting that approach to attempt the skill again with more success. Explicit learning is conscious. We can verbally describe those critical parameters of a task, consciously finding solutions. Implicit learning is occurring on a subconscious level and is a response to the environmental demands. So implicit learning is actually possible regardless of age, intelligence, or motor ability and is seen as appropriate for children with cerebral palsy or altered movement dynamics. Our feedback may be intrinsic, verbal feedback, modeling, or physical guidance. And this rings back to our most to least and least to most prompting slide. If we think about intrinsic feedback versus the explicit feedback of verbal and modeling input. So the intrinsic feedback is inherent in the sensory motor system and is not conscious, promoting implicit learning. So the intrinsic feedback is not under conscious control, and this implicit learning can be facilitated by structuring the task and the environment, supporting those effective movement patterns. We want to limit verbal feedback, as that would contribute to more conscious learning. This will enhance implicit motor learning. It involves the external focus of attention and practicing the whole skill in, in entirety. Extrinsic feedback, on the other hand, augments and supplements the intrinsic feedback. This is related to conscious learning. This compares to extrinsic feedback involving verbal instructions or visual observational learning with modeling and or physical guidance. And this is supplementing the intrinsic feedback. How essential is this? Well, the outcome with the augmented feedback is definitely going to depend on the type or the difficulty of the skill, the person's ability, and their stage of learning. But if done correctly, it can help speed the process of learning. So we're going to take some time to look at the research on extrinsic feedback. We can think about the type or the content of the feedback, as well as the amount and timing of the feedback. This influences outcome. Content may be focusing on the process of the movement, whether in feedback or in instruction. It may be focusing on the outcome of the movement. It may focus on error. It may focus on success. Timing is important, whether we're giving that feedback consistently or less often. When we give the feedback, and whether that is as a summary or fading it over time, or only providing it at a certain bandwidth. So all these approaches have motor learning terms, and we'll just look at the research for each of these. Knowledge of performance pertains to the movement pattern. Knowledge of results is in regards to the outcome of the movement in terms of the environmental goal. So both forms of feedback have their place. This 2018 study by Bishop was with children with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder practicing an underhand toss for cornhole. Knowledge of performance feedback may be helpful when a specific movement is required for a skill or the movement is more complex. This may be prescriptive, where we tell a person what to do to prevent or correct errors, or it may be descriptive, where we're simply describing and encouraging the learner to find their own solutions. So prescriptive is appropriate right at the beginning, but descriptive later on will encourage learners to find their own solutions. Knowledge of results, on the other hand, is focusing on the outcome of performing a skill in terms of achieving the goal and does not describe the process or movement involved. There is a lot more research on knowledge of results feedback. Knowledge of results when given verbally can be helpful when that task intrinsic or knowledge of performance feedback isn't being processed well and can help promote certainty. That brings us to the concept of internal versus external focus. The internal focus has more to do with the movement of the body part, whereas the external focus is looking at the concrete environmental outcome of the movement. We can think, for example, of a child 
who attempts to walk straight by evening out their stride length versus a child who walks alongside a wall and avoids veering into the wall. The internal focus results in conscious control of one's movement and may actually constrain the motor system, whereas the external focus allows the motor system to naturally self-organize with the abilities that are available and inherent to the person, resulting in more effective learning without that conscious control. Errors versus correct. What is better, to point out errors or to praise positive performance? Let's first think about implicit learning. This is where the feedback is, is occurring intrinsically through your sensory system. For those initial stages of practice, we may do better to constrain errors and rather promote good movement for gaining a skill. Explicit learning, on the other hand, is that verbal conscious feedback. We do know that providing error information will improve skills. However, providing positive information is motivating. So we do need a combination in order to promote what's known as a growth mindset. Motivational praise can be done in more than one way. This study was with 10-year-old children performing a throwing task for accuracy. Both groups received truthful feedback on the accuracy of their throw, but one group received bogus positive praise, complimenting their performance as being above average and better than peers. Those that received that additional praise actually performed better in retention trials. And we can also look at that feedback as either focusing on the child themselves as a great player, soccer player, or on the task as something that is acquirable. And in the outcomes of the research, the children who receive non-generic feedback focusing more on the task than on the child themselves perform better on the retention test. Now we'll look at the amount and the timing of the feedback. Findings show that the more frequent feedback interferes with learning. And this Hemaya Talab study was with children with cerebral palsy ages 5 to 17 performing a dart throw. The group that had 100% knowledge of results feedback for all their trials did not perform as well for long-term learning. This may be because consistent feedback promotes reliance on that feedback and discourages the individual's ability to detect error intrinsically, and this is borne out with research on adults. Interestingly, interestingly, these findings are borne out more with adult research, whereas with children, more feedback actually results in better learning when the task is difficult or complex. So the frequency of feedback will depend on the task difficulty as well as on the age and skill level of the learner. There may be times when more feedback is better. Now let's think about when the feedback is given. The problem with concurrent feedback or feedback given immediately at completion or right after the movement is that it may improve performance during the practice, but it's not better for learning retention. Again, we're distracting from that task intrinsic feedback and that important implicit learning that is needed. So the only times when this type of feedback may be appropriate would be, again, when it's facilitating learning of critical features of a task where task intrinsic feedback is difficult to process, but we don't want to promote dependence on the feedback. Instantaneous knowledge of results degrades learning, whereas when we wait a few seconds, we have better results with feedback. When it's given too soon, it interferes with internal processing, but when it's delayed, it can facilitate that processing. Think about the time between the end of the practice and the provided feedback. We want that delay. Also think about the time between the feedback given and the beginning of the next practice attempt. Don't rush that. This post-KR interval is also important. That's when the learner is engaging in planning and processing and processing that feedback to implement their next attempt 
plan of action. When we think about reducing feedback, there are ways to do this. Summary, faded, and bandwidth. Summary is giving that feedback after a certain number of trials, which can be averaged. And for simple skills, we can do those as longer summaries, less frequently. For more complex skills, we'll probably want to provide shorter summaries and more frequently. Fading the feedback is reducing the feedback frequency, even to the point of only providing it when requested by the learner. As an example, giving feedback for 50% of the trials and reducing that to when it becomes self-selected. And in our case, it may be a matter of a child turning and looking to us to indicate that they would like feedback. Bandwidth is providing feedback only if the errors are outside a certain range of correctness and we may decide to give no feedback within that band. So bandwidth feedback is when the knowledge of results is given only if the outcome of the movement is more than a certain amount in error. And the important thing here is, as we individualize it and set that standard, perhaps the bandwidth size doesn't matter so much as the fact that the learner knows when they will be receiving less feedback. Here we can see it visually, the child's performance across the top of the graph there. Summary feedback given at intervals, faded feedback given first more frequently and then less frequently, and bandwidth feedback only when the child is outside a certain margin of error. So we've covered all these terms with motor learning. We'll just finish up with modeling and physical guidance and that will bring us to our product demo. Observational learning is when demonstration may provide information that otherwise would be hard to grasp through verbal input. And that can be useful in the case of children with disabilities, particularly when a specific movement is needed or for more complex tasks where that observational learning is helpful. Modeling or demonstration is less effective when you're trying to refine an existing movement pattern or when the goal outcome is not actually dependent on one way of doing it. And again, demonstration can be self-selected or self-controlled. We want to consider how we can couple that modeling with a verbal focus on an outcome goal, the main thing being that our learner is encouraged to find novel solutions to the problem at hand and is not prescribed, something that may not be effective given their particular motor abilities. Peer modeling can be useful. Hearing the feedback given to another learning model or observing a variety of other models. But let's remember demonstration is not necessarily more effective than verbal feedback, certainly not as effective as physical practice and we can always allow the learner to first perform physical practice and then observe the demonstration or alternate between. Physical guidance, maybe manual guidance to provide correct positioning. Physical support is giving stability or constraining movement to reduce the degrees of freedom that the learner needs to control. And here is where our equipment comes in. As we look at the human body, we can think about the trunk and upper extremities, and we can think about the lower extremities. Walking demands that core strength and postural control. It also demands lower extremity strength and maintaining the center of gravity over the base of support. So think about the core stability and how a handheld support requires more independence on the part of the individual than support at the shoulders or trunk. In terms of the lower extremity, we can provide weight-bearing assist or we can provide guidance at the limbs. Fading that physical support becomes very important. And these examples are from the MOVE curriculum in terms of transitioning from a solid mechanical support to where the child is able to simply walk with a flexible strap held between your hand and theirs. So let's now move to our product demonstration, looking at prompt reduction concepts. So this is the large pacer. We also have the XL and the medium, small, and mini. And here you see the dynamic upper together with the standard base. We do also offer a utility outdoor base option, as well as a standard upper 
as we think about gait training with the pacer, one consideration is whether or not to use the dynamic feature. The vertical and the lateral shift available with the dynamic feature enables natural body movement to facilitate gait training for weight shifting and for clearance of, of the body over the stance foot. In conjunction with the decision whether or not to use that dynamic upper, which is most helpful with children who have extreme spasticity and tonal issues so that some of that movement can be absorbed by the frame. We do also want to think about our casters. And here we can limit the degrees of freedom that the user is needing to control. For example, this swivel lock will force the gait trainer to move forward in parallel in combination with a forward only ratchet to prevent backward movement. That's very effective. We also have a drag feature to provide resistance for the walker who moves too fast as well as to help prevent veering for a child who tends to slide uh, head over in one direction with their gait. We can increase resistance on one side to straighten that out. Now we'll look at our upper extremity and trunk supports, which of course are used in combination. We'll start with the arm prompts. The clamp secures to the top bar and can be placed on either the inside or the outside of the frame. The post can be positioned to point inward or outward, forward or backward. This one knob at the base of the arm prompt allows you to swivel and slide to get the positioning needed. In this case, we're showing how the arm prompts can be placed forward and together as a way to stabilize the upper trunk and enable that shoulder girdle forward of the hip girdle for early gait achievement. We can also place the we can also place the post so that it's pointing backward. Again, adjusting the knob to enable placement just where you would like that arm prompt to go. The closer it is next to the trunk and the farther back that the elbow is under the shoulder girdle would be enabling some weight bearing through the arm and a more upright posture. That may be a goal for later learning. Generally, we suggest that the arm prompt is the last prompt to be removed. That is because with a typical walker, a child will be using their arms to control the movement, as well as this distal positioning enables more practice of the core stability and the trunk. At first, certainly you do, you do need to provide support there, and that's the function of the chest prompt. Here we see the medium size. This can be elevated and it can also be tilted forward. So again, for that forward positioning, for better momentum and forward stepping initially, and then bringing it more upright, and in fact lowering it as the child is gaining in their core and trunk strength. You can loosen these straps, loosen the chest prompt overall, again, to challenge that core stability over the base of support. We can, in fact, simply flip the chest prompt in place to get it even lower around the child's hips. So that is another positioning option. From here, we're going to discuss the weight-bearing assist options.
and these at the same time also position the hip girdle relative to the shoulder girdle. We'll look at the multi-positioning saddle first. So the multi-positioning saddle secures into the upper frame and can fit simultaneous to use of the chest prompt. The concept with the MPS is that we're providing very positive, specific positioning of the hip girdle and pelvis. We have height adjustment. We have angle adjustment. And then we have forward and back adjustment as well. So we can angle the trunk forward by adjusting the saddle angle. We can also adjust depth and height of the hip corral. And this is providing very solid weight bearing support as well as positioning of the hip girdle. And it's connected with that dynamic upper. So any movement of that upper frame will bring the hip girdle along with it. And that's a very key feature in terms of the dynamic gait training of the, for the entire um, component of the trunk and hip. Now we will discuss the hip positioner and pelvic supports as alternative options for the um, weight bearing support. This is the medium hip positioner. It secures with the handholds onto the back of the frame. And these, again, can be placed anywhere along the top bar. The front straps of the hip positioner can be placed on any of the existing prompts. For example, around the chest prompt, around the arm prompt, or even up on the crossbars of the chest prompt. And the idea here is that you can adjust the length of those straps to encourage weight bearing assist, or raise the front of the hip positioner if you need to prevent forward motion of the pelvis relative to the shoulder girdle. The hip positioner can also be placed in a reverse position using the buckles on these straps. And that would be done simply buckling it right around the front crossbar and then bringing the front straps to the handholds. So that is the option there. Next, I'll show the pelvic support. This is the medium pelvic support. You'll notice that it's narrower and more malleable and can be certainly more comfortable for your youngest children or your um, larger adults. And here we can again use those ring clips on the handholds and optionally put the front clips on the chest prompt crossbars and then 
decide where the best positioning is for the handhold. It can be pointing inward or pointing forward to get your optimal positioning of the pelvic support for that particular individual. So as you lengthen the straps, this then becomes more of a safety sling and fall arrest harness as the individual is putting more weight through their own limbs. As a general rule, we want the weight bearing assist happening along this flat strap near the back. And don't be afraid to lift either the handholds or the entire frame in order to really properly off weight and get that initial weight bearing assist so that the legs really can straighten and perform extension weight bearing and reciprocal stepping in the early training. Now we'll look at thigh prompts and ankle prompts. So these are the large thigh prompts and the clamp again can be on the outside or the inside of the frame. In the instance where the chest prompt is on the inside, you may choose to place this on the outside for clearance. These two knobs will enable the adjustment for a adduction and abduction. So we would like this cuff to be around the knee or just above the knee. And these knobs can be tightened to assure that that abduction is occurring in gait, prevention of scissoring. And it can also help prevent the client from turning within the frame and enable still the weight bearing and step taking. This is different than the purpose of the ankle prompt. The ankle prompt does have an ankle cuff and it secures right into the underside of the frame. But the important thing here is these slides, spring adjusted, and that accommodates leg stride. So that if we need to assure that the child's feet stay behind and don't get too far ahead of them, we can actually place that adjustment to limit the stride length. Conversely, for a child who needs that cueing to bring their leg forward, as the frame moves forward, this will remind, their, remind them to take a step and limit the ability of the foot to get too far behind them in gait. So that is an excellent option and so that clips right into the underside of the frame and also serves the dual purpose of preventing scissoring along, used along with the thigh prompts as needed. And we can open up that stride as the child gains their walking ability. So enjoy the rest of your day and thanks for being with us.